Uh, effective altruism movement is not exactly flawless, but it is the best thing going today because what it does is it highlights all the counterintuitive ramifications stemming from conventional charity practice, right? The stuff that routinely gets overlooked by sentimentalists and people who are immersed in intuitively driven giving, like knee-jerk philanthropy, which is still technically better than doing nothing, but the sentimentalists are people who don't question their feels over real starting points. Um, the, the charities they choose have no feedback loops, hardly any transparency, and because they've already donated, they've done their part. And who needs follow-up? Well, effective altruists need follow-up. As a matter of fact, effective altruists demand follow-up as a core principle. See, because effective altruists are all about giving and are highly skeptical of their feels, to the point where gut instincts and intuitions are ultimately rendered useless, or at least next to useless. There might be some minimal overlap between the two, but the moment a given intuition collides with efficacy, the intuition is sent packing. So I've been enticed by that Vulcan-esque element of effective altruism in a slow burn sort of way over the last year, year and a half. And by this stage, I consider their non-proximate, anti-intuitionist methodology to be the most appropriate game plan for doing good better, as the tagline goes. Um, and I want to see more people throw in with them, warts and all, to the point where spreading the results of their research, and all the research their associated groups have done um, the last five years or so, as long as they've been operational. It could be over five years, though, I'd have to double check. Um, yeah, to the point where doing that seems like the next logical step for this channel. And that speaks to how dismal things are in general. That this, well, what is this? This starkly life-affirming movement? A movement focused mostly on survivalist values, like extending lives and perpetuating positive value with disvalue minimization taking a backseat to that. Um, that this is the closest thing cosmic pessimists have to prioritarianism in action, or some variant of threshold negative utilitarianism in action. Um, there really is nothing else out there putting a magnifying glass on all the waste and all the opportunity costs of donating intuitively. Now, of course, when I look at um, devotees of radical ethics and radical movements in general that are unaffiliated with effective altruism, there are people who are more negative-minded than the average EA, but at the same time, these people are highly ideological. Um, they're one-track thinkers, so to speak. And by this, I mean they're, they're obsessed with all these low-probability, high-impact agendas over long time horizons, which in practice just amounts to ineffectiveness, uh, decades of ineffectiveness, as we have seen, right? much like with any flavor of radical politics. Just ask yourself, what do people who dwell on radical politics actually accomplish 99 times out of 100? Now, this has to be like the 14th time. If you look at the American scene, it has to be like in the double digits, in the last decade, where political junkies and even pundits um, are talking about momentum and how, well, we can't lose this momentum. Well, you're going to lose it. If you've lost it before, you'll lose it again. It always happens. And when I try to promulgate effective altruism throughout these groups, it gets less traction than when I bring it to the attention of the non-ideological or to the less ideologically inclined groups, people who are wise enough to not waste their time with um, following pseudo-epidemics in the political sphere, like political theater, as it's been called. Um, or as with some hardcore pessimists, EA gets dismissed because they're so allergic to the fact that, yeah, most EAs do value the continuation of lives for its own sake. But that need not be a deal breaker, unless you're just unhinged in your pro-mortal fetishism. Um, so, so just in terms of well-structured organizations and online communities making a real impact on the most severe levels of suffering, like the sort of stuff that's endured by the worst off, yeah, effective altruism is the only game in town. Because oftentimes, 
lengthening lives will actually coincide with reducing top tier suffering, given how painful and, and prolonged many of these death processes are, especially overseas. Right, so EA and its offshoot GiveWell does plenty of research oriented around these randomized control trials, and they do it in a way that no other charitable community does. So at some point you've got to give credit, right? And despite the fact that there are some cons, right? It's not all pros 100% of the time, but it's the best way to walk the walk, all things considered. Um, if you're looking for an effective group that's going to be 100% aligned with your worldview, you're just going to look forever. It's, it's just not going to happen for you. So let's go over some of the pros and cons. The pros include... Um, they keep pointing to data showing how global or local charities that you hear about if you're watching this and you're living in the West, like first world cancer charities that always get shoved down our throats, those are roughly 100 times less effective in terms of bang for your buck leading to beneficence. They may be every bit as benevolent as the top ranked charities of GiveWell, but they are nowhere close to being every bit as beneficent. Okay, so if you're after sanctimony, this won't really bother you much since, well, they have you covered on the benevolence part. But if you're concerned with actual efficacy, like take for instance famine relief. Like you can alleviate starvation a hundredfold if you donate across the Atlantic for one penny on the dollar in your homeland. Right? If you're living in an affluent country or even in a relatively affluent one. Um, Obviously, the varying level of affluence and, and purchase power results in a sort of a sliding scale effect there. But for an economic powerhouse, the beneficence differential will be a hundredfold. Um, like 33% of Western charity donations go to med research, then it's uh, youth, then um, I think it's followed by elderly and hospice. Compare all that to global poverty issues. About a billion people living on less than, in U.S. currency, on less than $1.25 a day. Like, countering the fact that m money has diminishing marginal utility, and suddenly helping the worst off in our societies, like the local worst off, suddenly doing that doesn't seem like the most impartial way of doing things. It doesn't seem like the most impartial way to go about doing things when it's possible to help the global worst off merely by doing away with proximity bias and looking into GiveWell's recommendations. Source below. Uh, now, if you have some original knockdown arguments for heightened attentiveness in favor of proximity, I'm always willing to lend an ear to those arguments. But what you'll find is that people will either stick to their guns in terms of age and relative moral underpinnings, which are against bird's eye view, theories of ethics. They'll do that or they'll point to some practical problem, aka non-moral problem, when it comes to assisting unknown individuals overseas. The problem with that is it's still technically applicable to assisting perfect strangers who are nearby in your own region, like regional morality. It still has that same stumbling block. You still don't know the character of the person you're donating to, even if the person is a local. Um, the most serious issue with overseas donations, I suppose, would be the question of whether or not um, any of the recipients harbor pernicious anti-Western ideologies. And that is a legit concern. I'll be the first to point out that when faced with an option between a dollar going to Starvin Marvin, who is not being indoctrinated, and a dollar of someone's going to someone who is being indoctrinated, no one should be flipping any coins to determine which one of these two people gets the money, regardless of the fact that they are equally starved. If you're asking me, I will opt with my dollar for the one who is allowed to think for himself and therefore who is less likely to end up a societal menace or an anti-Western menace of some sort. And I'm not sure to which extent prominent effective altruists share this concern. Um, so. Now we're getting into the con area, I suppose. If they don't share it, and if there's no way to buffer against recipients who might have potentially detrimental ideologies, um, 
in favor of those with more benign worldviews. That's definitely something to look into, and I have sent some emails inquiring about the ins and outs of this, though I haven't heard anything back as of yet. You'd think the overwhelming majority would understand that moral impartiality should not extend to ideologies, and that it should only apply to non-cognitive attributes of all persons. Um, as we've seen with recent cultural debates in the West, like accommodationists and, again, sentimentalists will conflate impartial concern with ideological blindness, like universalism. Forget universalism. Focus instead on impartial concern, with all else being the same. Impartialism doesn't mean that when faced with the ultimatum of saving um, a random fanatic from drowning on the right side of the pond versus saving a standard, non-combatant, benign person from drowning on the left side of the pond. It doesn't mean that decisional apathy or decisional ambivalence is appropriate in any way. No. That might be a rights-based construal or a non-consequentialist formulation of barefaced impartiality a sort of naive impartiality, but it's never a consequentialist formulation. Consequentialists, especially scalar consequentialists, are only impartial to the extent that all else looks to be equal on the ideological front. Permutation-wise, and obviously, cognitive attributes matter. Ideological factors matter. Non-cognitive attributes, not so much, or not at all. So yeah, you control for that, and done deal. And just for the record, I am yet to hear of a case where someone who has had their life prolonged by some EA intervention, um, that that person went on to commit some atrocity because the funds were allocated to a hostile territory harboring Islamists or something. Hasn't happened yet. So if anything, the bigger issue would be the beneficiary breeding more impoverished individuals after being leveled up. And I'm sure that many EAs would be open to the proposition of bribing the beneficiaries out of their fertility, um, if enough would-be EAs make that the conditional uh, deal-breaker, like that the condition for joining the movement. Um, another reason why I'm bringing all this to YouTube landscape, because we need more people to make that the condition and the deal-breaker. As far as I know, no one's made that the deal-breaker as of yet, so... They'll take it seriously, as with anything else in politics, right? You have a group that's going to make their presence known, and suddenly, when it comes to swing states or stuff like that, if they're present there at the most, the big candidates will listen to them. Same thing applies here. So, there's this idea that reducing scholastic absenteeism in sub-Saharan Africa regions where minors suffer from uh, parasitic intestinal worms like, conventional wisdom says that subsidizing programs that get those kids more textbooks, programs that reduce class size, um, get, get them better teachers, get them better counselors who are more hands-on in terms of follow-through, like, that that's the way to get better educational results for these kids. But no, turns out that donating to deworming charities is the actual way to get somewhere. That's how you do it. It's deworming that does the trick. Highly counterintuitive, yes, but there you go. Source in the description. Randomized control trials keep pointing to intestinal worms playing a pivotal role in keeping youth out of classrooms in Sub-Saharan Africa, the worst regions of it anyway. Um, so I'll link to GiveWell's number one ranked deworming charity. It's also something that does not just prolong lives, because the malady is not fatal, um, no one dies because of intestinal worms. Getting rid of intestinal worms just increases the victim's standard of living. Um, so that's a very important point that you don't hear made outside of EA circles. Another thing you don't hear is that ethical consumerism is a very mixed bag. For instance, boycotting goods produced in sweatshops um, is actually very counterproductive because what happens is, well, what's the, what's the alternative, right? 
are wage slaves working in sweatshops because they have better options or, or they, they had better options all along and they chose to ignore those options? Why? Because they're masochists? No, of course not. The sweatshop is the least shitty option for them. Now, you can say that that's scandalous and we need political solutions ASAP and okay, we agree. Now what? We agree that politics can ideally fix something horrific at the systemic level. We agree. Whoopee. What's the next move? What? What, go stand in front of City Hall with a megaphone and, and, and vent your frustrations about how overseas working conditions are unacceptable? Brilliant. Systemic change is going to take forever. The moment you make it about politics and um, you devote a huge chunk of your free time to political activism, it'll be a time sink, comparatively speaking, because there's too many vested interests. Even freaking Bono can't ch bring systemic change to these places, so you're not going to either. In the meantime, try not to boycott and eliminate the one option these people do have, with the knowledge that they won't have superior alternatives the following week or the following month or God knows how long it might take for a real alternative that's decent for employment for them to kick in, for any of the workers to kick in in these regions. And, and loosely related to that is um, fair trade goods, and <laughs> they really do achieve next to nothing because only about 4-5% to of the markup actually goes to ground level farm workers. The rest is just you paying for hike profits. Price discrimination. Um, overwhelmingly, there is no difference between incomes earned by workers uh, employed by fair trade farms and workers employed by other farms. Fair trade consumerism really is a gimmick. Protectionism is a different animal, but from the consumer standpoint, yeah, uh, ethical consumerism is more often than not just a gimmick. Um, I guess the major con when it comes to effective altruism is the animal welfare wing of the movement and how it's highly neglectful of wild animal hardship because it's focused mostly on farmed animal suffering, like the stuff humans cause. But I think I need to get into that in a different video because um, it's just going to take a lot of time to go over fully and to drive the point home looking into how animals counter into all of this. It's a whole different can of worms and bag of tricks and um, I want to try to make this relatively short at least and that next video is probably going to annoy vegans and vegetarians because much of their change or diet advocacy has shown to be ineffective like people generally agree with factory farming being wrong that mistreating animals in all these different ways is wrong that subsidizing to these things subsidizing these things is impermissible, damn near impermissible, um, they agree on the advocacy part, but then they do nothing about it diet-wise. There is no follow-through on their part. So the way to actually assist animals is not to have discourse with the average carnist, like the, the people who actually eat meat because of a lack of willpower to stop eating meat. Um, that's not how you actually get to the efficacy. And I'll get into how you get efficacy in a video down the road, probably two videos down the road is when I'll do it. Um, now, I do have a strategic thing here that I'm not seeing proposed by anyone in effective altruism, and that's really going to be the crux of how I want anyone who watches this and considers donating, um, it's really how I want them to consider approaching this. It has to do with how minimalists should donate, and the odds are if you're watching this, you're something of a minimalist, and I consider myself minimalist by Western standards, at least. It's probably why I'm so taken in by EA, is that I have the means to contribute, because I don't go around spending on bullshit that I don't need. Um, but for minimalists who don't have familial opulence to fall back on, and i um, one of those, um, and I, I can't stress just how much I am one of those who don't have anything in the way of um, legacy wealth to fall back on. Um, any sort of saving is a saving that once, I'm, once I've rid myself of it, I will have nothing, right? So 
in light of that, I think the best approach is a procrastination friendly one. Now, I have a very hard time psychologically donating anywhere near my full potential. Right? And just, just for the record, um, for every last one of us who is employable, the full potential is technically marked by 100% of our disposable incomes. That's the fullest of the full potential. Now, donating less than that and falling short of moral perfectionism is not the end of the world. Like self-indulgence doesn't make you a moral criminal. It just makes you fall short of moral sainthood, as they say. We are all ethically suboptimal, and that's okay. That doesn't discredit the actual theory and its demandingness. And this is why it's totally inane to still conceive of ethics in terms of binary right versus wrong injunctions, where failing to donate 100% of your disposable income to high-impact charities somehow would make you a moral criminal. Right? You, got, you got to understand, all talks of rightness and wrongness should strike you as archaic conceptual schemes. This is easier for me to recognize because I've never been a moral absolutist, aka non-consequentialist. I've always held consequences as primary and all other features of ethics as secondary or worse. Um, but even most consequentialists, in my experience, will cling to right versus wrong verdicts, which indicates their unfamiliarity with scalar consequentialism, like summarized by betterness and worseness. An action can only ever be better or worse when evaluated against some other action, and ditto when looking at general states of affairs. So nothing is impermissible. All verdicts are either better or worse to some extent. So that ties into my particular psychological barriers to donate the amount I ideally can, conceivably, without surrendering anything of comparable value to myself. So let's assume UBI doesn't kick in during our lifetimes. So you get mass unemployment looming due to computerization and robotics. And when you don't have top tier credentials to keep you employed in some future cutthroat job market, and you don't have anything resembling um, a monetary contingency plan, should you presently donate all your disposable income um, and or savings to alleviate the worst suffering present in the world right now, then what you do is you open yourself up to potential disaster on a personal level down the road. Um, I'm thinking of Peter Singer's pond hypothetical, right? The shallow pond thing. It's just a pair of fancy shoes and business attire that you're sacrificing by parting ways with it. It probably just costs uh, upwards to a couple of hundred dollars to do so. Um, but parting ways with a huge chunk of annual income repeatedly is far more demanding and could cripple anyone down the road, any minimalist down the road, should Western economies turn, turn out to be as much of a race to the bottom as non-Western economies are. Now, that's highly speculative because UBI is a possibility, a, a likely one, as far as I can tell. But we have to think worst case scenario if we're going to promulgate ethical theories with such demandingness. So is there a way to be effective and to maintain peace of mind? Um, I guess that would be the ultimate question, right? Of course, it all depends on when you choose to donate. You can be as effective decades from now as you can be today if you donate the comparative amount. Whether you donate it today or decades from now is immaterial. Um, and effective altruists don't discuss this uncertainty element when it comes to the high impact. They talk about how giving makes their lives more fulfilling. And, you know, um, that's <laughs> very bourgeoisie of them. I'm happy for them, but it is a sort of bourgeoisie statement. Um, most people don't share their psychological profile. I know I don't. Even if I'm giving as low as 10% of my annual income, which is what they recommend most individuals individuals interested in joining the movement do, um, is to start with 10% and see where it goes. But even this could cause me to have some worries. Like, what if that 10% annually extended to a decade of giving ends up being the difference maker for someone sinking or swimming 
when shit hits the fan, um, the Western fan, as it were. This is a legitimate, understandable, psychological barrier to giving. And I haven't seen it addressed, at least not by any of the prominent EAs. Um, and I don't know why they haven't discussed it broadly, because there's an easy way around it. You request a reallocation of your savings and assets after you've croaked. Doing nothing in the here and now is fine, but doing nothing prospectively means the immediate or extended family members of yours, who you may not like, but even if you do like it doesn't matter because we've established impartiality as a baseline, right? So they get your savings and assets, or maybe your government gets it, at least some of it, and that's hardly any better because, like I said, there's too many vested interests in politics for your government to ever really put that money to effective use in the way high-impact EAs would. Plus, there's no transparency with governmental spending, whereas with GiveWell's top-ranked charities, you bet your bottom dollar there's transparency. So in that sense, uh, I've taken somewhat of a step back from previous anti-inheritance, like anti-person-oriented inheritance attitudes. Um, as is the case with most political solutions, like so-called solutions, politics really is the mind killer. And if you're looking for prioritarian solutions, you need to think apolitically, because those types of solutions are in all likelihood apolitical in nature. Whereas if you are concerned with trivialities, like the, the I don't know, stuff like disparities between groups in some STEM field or some other tribe, who's, who's overrepresented, who's underrepresented, yeah, okay, go, go, go look to political theater for solutions, because that's what it is. It's fucking theater. So let's not get sidetracked too much with any of that noise. The signal to noise ratio in political discussions is shameful and fatuous. And it gets worse and worse on a yearly basis because more, 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 more political junkies keep coming in. More noise, less signal. The internet's being populated by doofuses. Um, but that's a separate video. So, how do you do something prospectively with your savings? Well, you set up a specific impartial inheritance scheme. Uh, bequests, legacy gifts, given to charities upon a person's passing. It's by definition a document that can't be do um, altered after the benefactor has died. Meaning, it's the sort of thing you want to process immediately and you want to define all the parameters beforehand. And you don't even need to fill out a traditional will for this. There are financial accounts, just off the top of my head, the ones at Vanguard and Fidelity, where you can do the whole transfer on death allocation just by filling out a few forms. Um, so I'll link to an article showing that American retirees leave an average of 177,000. And I think it's relevant for me to uh, point to this average because most of my clicks, most clicks for my viewership are American clicks. Um, and I also like to think that the individuals who are sold on inheritance and partiality generate the majority of my viewership. So I don't have to make any sort of ground level argument about how A leads to B and B leads to C. All I have to do is make the methodological argument which I guess I can file under X leads to Y and Y leads to Z. Right, so in terms of methodology, the average effective altruist urges us to donate ASAP. Like Peter Singer even says, it'll make you happier. But it can cause anxiety in the here and now if you're a minimalist. It can never cause anxiety after you're dead. It can only help others without any cost to yourself. And I think if effective altruists pushed this point, many more working class and perhaps even lower middle class folk would sign up for the transfer on death method for doing good better, as they say. Um, and I suppose I can call that added bit of advice regarding post-mortem donations uh, doing good even better. Um, 